What's up, factory workers? Today, we're going to put into production the high-grade RP79 ball twin set. As you all know by now, I'm a big fan of the underpowered, underrated, and unloved grunt unit kits. And thus, this kit is perfect for the factory. The kit comes with two ball units, but in this video, I'm only going to paint one of them as I have something else planned for the other one. Stay tuned for that video. Anyway, it's time to start the work shift. Let's do our best. Eagerly, I open the box and unbox the contents. The box comes with three runner bags and the manual. No stickers included. I take a quick glance at the manual. It appears to be a simple build. The kit comes with three runner bags, each of which contains two identical runners. As usual, I promptly begin the straight build. Often during any build, some parts have to be painted before they are permanently assembled into a section of a kit and then masked with masking tape. Straight building a kit before painting it allows me to understand the kit so that I am able to visualize the steps I'm going to take during prep work. Also taking a before and after pic or video is a good way to compare and admire your hard work. It was a very quick build. Some of you talented builders might be able to assemble the ball in under half an hour. But I admit, it took me like 45 minutes. I'm not a big fan of this stand. I probably won't be doing much with it, to be honest. Built straight out of the box, the ball looks okay. I see tons of detail that unfortunately is muted because it's mostly molded out of the same color plastic. I'm sure that with panel lighting and a flat top coat, it wouldn't look too bad though. However, I'm going to do my best to try and bring out those details and hopefully show the true potential of the ball. What's really cool about this kit is that both ball units come with two armament options. The 180mm recoilless cannon and the double cannon, so you can build two of each or two of the same. It's great, and in my opinion, worth the money. I'm stoked on this build. But for now, we close up shop and get some rest. The real work starts tomorrow.
The next day, I begin by disassembling the ball to get it ready for prep work. Disassembling the ball was a bit tricky as the pieces have pretty tight fit tolerances. Instead of using a hobby knife and risk marring or damaging the parts while prying them apart, I use an old set of feeler gauges. These make disassembly much easier. I still take my time and do my best not to mar the surfaces because the feeler gauges are still metal and the plastic is relatively soft. Those plastic spudgers that you get in the phone repair kits also go a long way in helping you disassemble your kits. Once the ball is disassembled, I've worked out that I must paint the porthole window trim before I begin seam line removal of the main ball body. I give them a quick scuff with 600 grit sandpaper, and then I move on to custom mixing the orangey brownish red color for the portholes, the main hatch, and thrusters. As you can see, it was several colors, I just could not get the shade right for some reason. So if you need to see them, just pause the video and take a gander at them, write, write it down. I began spraying the portholes at the usual 20 psi. The paint was thin 1 to 1 ratio as in one part paint, one part thinner. I also taped up the fitting pegs because if you don't, you usually have trouble fitting everything back together. Paint buildup really makes it a tight fit, so you gotta watch out for that. After the paint's dry, I go ahead and reassemble the portholes into the ball. Now that the two main ball halves are back together, I go ahead and flow some thin cement into the seam lines. This pretty much seals in the portholes permanently. So you gotta be sure you're ready to commit as there's no going back short of sawing the ball halves apart. Ouch. Using a 12,000th file, I rework some of the panel lines where I feel they need to be deepened. Once the depth of the panel line is consistent, I go ahead and enlarge them using a scriber. After the glue has cured, I turn my attention to removing the seam lines. I use a cheapo file and some 400 grit sandpaper. Next, I'm going to rescribe the panel lines on the side nacelles as they're a bit skinny for my liking. Hard label tape makes it super easy to scribe straight lines. Nice, now the panel line is much more pronounced. I sand the nacelles using super fine 3M sanding sponge. and then clean up any plastic residue that worked itself into the panel lines using the scriber. Then using a piece of glass and a bit of sandpaper, I flatten the sides of the nacelle so that the end caps fit much nicer and tighter. Nice, now the nacelle has a nice straight consistent fit. Next, I separated the parts into two groups for washing. Parts that can be submerged and dried properly go into the parts washer. They are washed using a mild dish soap and warm water. I rinse the parts with warm water. It's always good practice to have an extra screen on your drain just in case you lose a part from your strainer. Otherwise, it's bye bye parts forever. The parts that cannot be submerged and properly dried like the nacelles and the main body get a good wipe down with isopropyl alcohol. I do my best not to get any isopropyl alcohol on the porthole windows as it will dissolve the paint. After letting the parts dry for a few hours, I place them on the alligator clips. Some of the smaller parts like the thrusters are too small for alligator clips so they get pressure fitted into chopsticks and toothpicks. Next, I gotta mask the portholes. 
first I cut a small piece of tape and place it over the porthole. Then using this dull pointed scribe that I made for this purpose, I slowly work the tape into the recessed area of the porthole. And using a very sharp hobby knife, I slowly cut the masking tape to the correct shape. I also tape around this area so that the paint doesn't mess with the fitment of the parts later on. And finally using a compass cutter, I cut a circle shape in the masking tape to mask the cockpit area. I will prime the parts using gray surfacer thinned at 1 to 1 ratio. That's one part thinner, one part primer. I spray the parts with my airbrush set at 25 psi. Originally, I was going to color match the ball's bluish color, but I realized that the gray primer color was actually looking pretty good on the ball. The gray color grew on me and I decided to keep it this color. So this is now both the primer coat and the base coat. And this works to my advantage because both it looks good and uh, I'm freaking lazy. Look at it though, the color just works out. It reminds me of the Verka color scheme. What do you guys think? Do you guys like it or should I have color matched it? And here's the parts after curing overnight. Next, using the custom red color I mixed earlier, I spray the rest of the trim parts. I will let these parts cure overnight. The balls manipulators have some detail that I like to bring out through color separation. I will be masking the manipulators leaving these cone areas exposed as I have a dark gray color in mind for these areas. This is a bit of a process so I just take my time and listen to some music and relax. There's some rectangular detail that I'd like to bring out on the arms. So as usual, I mask and then cut the shape out. I 
I will be painting these details with Mr. Color Gundam Color MS Phantom Gray. That's a mouthful. As always, thin, one part thinner, one part paint. I will also be painting the nacelles and caps this color. I'll only let these parts cure for a few minutes before I start removing the masking tape. And after all that work, we are rewarded with nice color separation. I began assembling the manipulators. And I also began assembling the nacelles to join both of these assemblies together. Wow, look at all that detail that was hidden in plain sight. This is the details that were muted by molding the plastic all in the same color. It looks great, I'm stoked. Originally I was not planning on painting the cockpit as the original blue color gives the yellowish clear window a nice green color. However, I ultimately decided to paint the interior with a metallic dark color. I think it'll look okay. So using a compass cutter, I cut out a circular mask and mask around the cockpit. I thinned some Tamiya X10 gunmetal, the usual one part thinner, one part paint, and sprayed the inside of the cockpit. It's a little dark, but I think it looks all right. Next, I turn my attention to the armaments. I do the usual seam line removal with a file and rework any panel lines with a 12 thousandths file. After removing the seam lines and rescribing panel lines, I give the barrels a good sanding with 3M super fine sanding sponge. I apply the same primer mixture from earlier. I only do a couple light coats on these parts. I will let these parts cure overnight. When the parts have cured, I go ahead and mask the parts to bring out some more details through color separation. I spray these details with Mr. Color Gundam Color MS Phantom Gray.
And using some of the leftover reddish paint from earlier, I paint some of the smaller details. To not have the barrels of the guns and the thrusters look all plain, I went ahead and smoked them out using alclad burnt iron. After letting the parts cure for a few hours, I go ahead and remove the masking tape. I have mixed feelings about this color scheme. I think it looks alright, but it's not exactly what I had in mind. It works though. Each one of the double cannons contains an area for the sensor. You know, the typical green camera. But instead of masking this area and painting it green, I'm just going to measure it out and cut out two lenses from a sheet of styrene. Once I have the two shapes fitted, I spray them with Tamiya X25 Clear Green. I will let this cure for a day, but I will not install them right away until it's final assembly time. For the big 180mm recoilless cannon, I go ahead and remove all the masking we did earlier. To reveal all this detail. Color separation really goes a long way. I really like this technique. The barrel is smoked out at the end but you can't really see it very well. Next I assemble all the smaller orange parts I painted earlier.
I think they give the cannon pretty good contrast. Next, I thin a little bit of Tamiya Extend Gunmetal for my paintbrush. And I paint the gear mechanism by hand. I also paint these small thrusters by hand. I think they're thrusters. They look like thrusters. I'm not actually sure. I painted them using Model Master's Chrome Silver. I wasn't too happy with the thrusters just being smoked out so I went ahead and applied a bit of really thinned out Model Master's Chrome Silver. I applied it more like a wash so that it would wash and mix along with the smoked out color. I think it turned out alright. Could have been better though. This time around I chose to panel line before clear coating. Technically your panel line washes will flow much better with a clear coat, but I guess I just really wanted a panel line without a gloss coat. It kind of worked out. I did notice that the panel liner would smear more giving it that dirty effect. It kind of worked out. I was actually pretty surprised that panel wash would flow this well on primer. And after making a huge panel lining mess, I would go ahead and move to final assembly. My balls come into life. Are you? Final assembly was actually very satisfying. At this point the ball looks nearly finished, but there's still a couple more things to be done. Using a bit of Instacure or super glue, I glue the camera lenses I made earlier in place. Next, I'm going to apply some aftermarket decals. This is the decal sheet that I bought for the Galbaldi beta video. You can check out that video by clicking on the card here. I set the decals using some microset solution. This was a very satisfying process. And aftermarket decals make high grade kits look so much better, more lifelike.
After the decals have set and dried properly, I go ahead and begin masking the window and the chrome bits. This is of course in preparation for the final top coats. As before, I use the compass cutter to cut circular masks. This makes it so much easier to mask the window and the thrusters. I just noticed I had that hobby knife right on top of the barrel. I'm, I can't believe that did not scratch. Be careful, don't be like me. <laughs> don't do that. After masking, we're ready for the good stuff. The deadly stuff. This is 2K Urethane Clear Coat. It's an automotive grade clear coat. Pretty much what they use for cars and collision repair shops. So the mixing ratio I used for this clear coat was 4 parts gloss coat, 2 parts hardener, and 2 parts reducer. The reducer acts like a thinner. And though technically the spec sheet calls for only one part reducer, since I won't be spraying it out of a large spray gun, I used twice the amount of reducer to thin the urethane clear coat enough to a consistency compatible with my airbrush set at 25 psi. So you already know how tough this stuff is. Just go try to scratch the clear coat from your car with your finger now. See, you, you probably won't be able to. I can't stress enough how much you still need to wear a mask and have a properly ventilated area when spraying this stuff. Anyway, a little goes a long way. So usually two thin coats of this clear coat will be enough to provide great protection and crazy scratch resistance. You won't be able to scratch it. I mean, unless you take a freaking key or knife to it, uh... But if you do that to your Gunpla models, you have bigger problems, my friend. Two K urethane clear coat has amazing leveling properties. It's good stuff. However, it does come with a few cons. The worst con in my opinion is that it's very hazardous to your health. You have to have the proper safety equipment to spray this. Thankfully I have both a mask and a very good spray booth to be able to spray this indoors. Next is that it actually takes a couple of days to fully cure. So for the first few hours it will actually be very squishy, you know. And you can leave fingerprints on it. I have done this before in another video and I've learned my lesson. I just spray it and let it cure for 48 hours I won't even touch it no I won't even look at it and finally it's the cost this stuff really isn't all that cheap usually you have to buy it in a system with reducer and hardener and it'll run you up there like close to 100 bucks now there is companies out there that will sell you smaller quantities I think what they do is they buy the large quantities and just reball it into small hobby sized bottles but they'll still charge you anywhere from 10 to 30 dollars for I don't know uh, a, a couple of ounces of each so it is expensive In retrospect, I should have removed the manipulators and the cells from the ball before laying down the clear coat as trying to hold on to the ball with a small toothpick inserted into the armament slot actually got tiring. You wouldn't believe how heavy it actually is and how hard it gets to hold it and keep it stable with just two fingers. Man, I started getting the shakes. And here's the parts after not looking at them for 48 hours. <laughs> Keeping in mind that I'm still not going to touch the parts with my bare hands because I still have one more flat top coat to do. And the oils on your fingers will make it difficult for you to lay down a top coat. It'll fish eye. It'll be bad. So for the final top coat, I will be using my favorite flat clear coat from Outclad. As usual, I spray it pretty heavy while still avoiding runs. Alclad flat coat levels really nice too. I really like spraying this stuff. It's so satisfying.
When you first spray the Alclad flat coat, it'll look glossy. But as it dries and cures, it'll go from a gloss finish to a flat finish. Man, here we go again. Shake mode. God, that ball is heavy. Spraying the final top coat is really satisfying. I like taking my time. And here's the parts after letting them cure for 48 hours. You know, sometimes I really wish I had a drying booth. Anyway, now moving on to final assembly. I eagerly remove all the masking tape, taking my time not to scratch anything, but I doubt it'll scratch. Some of the paint on the orange part came up when I pulled the tape off. You can see it there by the panel line where the paint came off, but this can be touched up later. So with all the masking tape removed, I move on to touch ups. Using a small detail brush, I just go ahead and paint over the blemishes and where the paint has come off. If you color match any parts, it's always good practice to have a bit of paint left over because if you scratch it or mess it up later on or a bit comes off when you're masking, you won't have any paint left over and it'll be really hard to rematch the color. And here I'm just touching up some of the overspray that made it onto the porthole window trim. And now for true final assembly. This is it. I can't wait to see what it looks like. I'm stoked. And here it is, the most honorable, glorious, and toxically masculine unit in the Gundam universe, in my opinion. The RB-79 Ball, ready to separate the whiny main characters from the man. No mopey, angsty teenage prototype mobile suit pilots dare come near it. All jokes aside, the ball was truly a heroic unit reserved for the bravest pilots that deep down knew the ball would most likely become their coffin. Because of its underpowered nature, the ball relied on heavy numbers, and thus suffered large numbers of casualties in the One Year War. And yet, these honorable pilots would still risk their lives and step into the ball cockpits day after day, battle after battle. This unit is an example of bravery and self-sacrifice, and it holds a very special place in my heart. Taking the time to paint the high-grade RB-79 ball twin set will really bring out its true potential. It has plenty of detail that unfortunately gets muted because it's molded out of the same color plastic. It is a masking heavy kit, but the detail it reveals is worth it. Aftermarket decals go a long way in enhancing this kit as well. It's definitely one of those kits that looks underwhelming at first, but once you paint it and customize it, you'll feel very rewarded. And I've seen people build these and get really creative with them. I think I've even seen Pokeball versions of them. 
It's pretty cool. I hope you guys like the build video for the ball. I've been working really hard on it for the past few weeks and I gotta admit it was getting pretty tough to finish this video. I didn't think it was going to be this long. Because this is still a small channel, it appears since March YouTube has tweaked their algorithm and the channel hasn't been getting much exposure lately. So if you liked the video, please share, like, and subscribe. This will let me know I'm doing something right and motivate me to keep making these build videos. Also, check out the factory's Instagram and Twitter accounts for updates in between videos. And if you'd like to directly support the factory, check out the new Patreon page. I'd be eternally grateful. Anyway, that concludes the work shift. Thank you for your hard work. I'll see you here on the next video.